we need to talk about New Atlantis's transit system. Located on the planet Jemison in the Alpha Centauri system is the largest city in the settled systems. And for some reason, the transit agency settled on pods as the main people mover. This is a gadget bond known as Personal Rapid Transit. It's the kind of transit that is sold to people who think a tram is old hat, and light rail brings crime, aurora, and skooma into their peaceful suburbs. Gadget bonds are supposed to represent the future of mass transit, but New Atlantis was beaten to the punch by 355 years. Back in 1975, when humans still lived on Earth, West Virginia University opened their own pod system. It may seem primitive compared to 24th century engineering, but this system was double-tracked, traveled a greater distance, and served more people. New Atlantis constructed a system that was inferior to what could be experienced centuries prior. Kind of like how Starfield is an inferior RPG compared to what could be experienced decades ago. I really wanted to like Starfield. It seems as though the last Bethesda RPG to receive critical acclaim was Skyrim back in 2011, and since then they haven't quite captured the same magic. Every major release from Bethesda Game Studios since then either just doesn't quite scratch the itch for a grand single-player adventure, or is outright worse than its predecessor. I think part of the reason people are exhausted with re-releases of Skyrim is because they just want Bethesda to finally make an RPG that captures the same acclaim. We've played Skyrim. This landscape has been thoroughly explored. We want a new, interesting world that is worth getting lost in. Starfield was supposed to be that game. It was meant to finally break the chain and live up to the standard set by Skyrim over a decade ago. Sadly, we are still waiting for that next great Bethesda RPG, and with each mediocre or bad release, it looks less and less likely to happen. At first, I thought I was liking Starfield, more than Fallout 4. But there was a distinct moment when I realized that this game just wasn't fun. The first contact mission. This mission begins with finding a mysterious spacecraft flying over Paradiso and docking it to investigate what's going on. You're human. This is a generation ship called the ECS Constant, and its passengers have lived out their whole lives on the ship in search of a new home. The reason you couldn't communicate is because it is incompatible with any existing communication systems. Technology on the outside world has become more advanced, and humans developed faster methods of space travel. At this point, I was invested. It was one of the more interesting premises that the game introduced, and I wanted to see the quest through. I spoke with everyone on the ship, and then I went back to Paradiso, so I could inform Paradiso Group's CEO that the spacecraft is not aliens. Unfortunately, this is where the quest goes downhill. Here's the conversation you have with them. Now, tell me, what are we going to do about it? Give me some proposals, people. I need something to work with here. We could offer to resettle them here. There's more than enough space. They could stay here. Temporarily. But it'll cost them. Quite a bit, too. They'd need to work off all their debts before being allowed to leave. Ah, uh, maybe not. What if we help them get out of here? Outfit their ship with a grab drive so they can find a new home. We could even lend our engineers to help and give their captain an updated star map. Sounds costly. We can't absorb that cost, and it's unlikely they even have compatible currency, let alone enough for the transaction. Someone else would have to foot the bill. Oh, I swear this would be a lot easier if they ceased to exist entirely. Anyway, Seema's got the right idea. Either works for me. Just tell me what you want to do. Oh, I didn't say that specifically. This would be a mutual contract or room and board in exchange for services rendered. Of course, there's no telling how long this arrangement will last, given the substantial costs we'd need to take on in order to accommodate them here, including their continued room and board. But this may save the resort on operating costs in the long term, as we'd be able to let go of some of our current paid staff. <laughs> These really are the three resolutions. Either you could make the ship's crew indentured servants to Paradiso Group, give their ship a new grav drive, and send them elsewhere, or blow it up for no reason. I hate every one of these options. 
The mention of indentured servitude was so appalling that I didn't want to even accept any of the CEO's options. I mean, if this is acceptable to them, it opens the question as to who else is placed under inhumane working conditions. If we do any snooping around, are we going to find out that the CEO is breaking any intergalactic labor laws? Unfortunately, the quest isn't open to doing any kind of investigation whatsoever. Okay, so Paradiso Group wants to have a profit stream to pay for the colonists living on the planet. Why can't I persuade him that the ship may make an interesting tourist attraction and have him use that to collect revenue while the colonists stay for free? The second option is probably the least bad one, since it doesn't enslave the crew or blow up the ship, but it still requires telling people who have spent their whole lives drifting through space to keep looking. Paradiso Group doesn't even fund the new grav drive. I had to pay out of pocket when I was solving another corporation's problem. There's also a really annoying sequence when you go down this route, where you must reroute the power from the port turbo pump to the auxiliary chirogenic radiator, turn the plasma runoff inhibitor to 5%, and decouple the magnetic flange pipe enclosures from the auxiliary module assembly. I kept messing the step up and needing this jerk to remind me of what I was doing wrong. There was no reason for the sequence to be here, it's just padding out the runtime. Once that is done, supposedly the colonists can now find a new home. This doesn't segue into anything. It would have been nice if I could build them an outpost on a planet of their choosing, that way I could at least help the colonists in some way. But instead, the ECS constant is supposed to just fly around elsewhere. This never actually happened on my save, and I'm not exactly sure why. It could be a bug, it could also be intentional. Sometimes it's hard to tell when playing Bethesda's games, hence why Joseph Anderson coined the term Bethesda's bug. The third resolution is comically evil. Blow up the whole ship because some morally bankrupt CEO told you to. There is no substance to an option like this. It honestly reminds me of Fallout 3. In that game, you could defuse the bomb in the center of the town Megaton, or you could blow up the whole town because someone told you to. Choice. It's the best part of being a real person. In this scenario, a hypothetical real person named Steven has a choice. He could spend years helping improve the quality of life for citizens of impoverished third world nations. Or he could systematically set fire to every orphan living in a 30 kilometer radius of his house. Which choice would you make? If there is any violent option I would have wanted to have, it's this. Paradiso? The marketing Someone for this place might be Stop! Oyen! Was everyone's life? What did they ever do to you? Why? All they wanted was their wish to be realized. You turned everything into a game. Cast them away like dogs. These are our lives here. They're not some toys you can just play with. Of course, this isn't an option either. Named characters cannot be killed, only the generic nameless ones. So, let me get this straight. Killing people who are okay with enslaving others is not an option, but blowing up a whole ship of people who have been drifting through space in search of a home is perfectly acceptable. This is the only time Paradiso Group is involved in a quest. Killing them would be inconsequential for the rest of the game. Other forms of violence against the CEO aren't an option either. I cannot threaten or intimidate him to make a better offer. I am forced to side with whatever resolutions are presented during this conversation. It's especially strange considering that the bar owner on the rooftop terrace says Oliver is a pushover. I have heard from multiple celebrity visitors that our CEO, Oliver Campbell, isn't as domineering and uh, virile as he lets on. At least not behind closed doors, if you catch my drift. Word is, he likes to be told what to do, and his uh, performance evaluations are often subpar. Why doesn't the quest let me use that to my advantage? Part of the conflict here is also completely fabricated. When asking why the colonists cannot live on the other planet, the CEO insists that Paradiso Group owns the entire planet. It's genuinely appalling that he is more concerned with how the planet looks on a brochure than people's lives. Here's an idea. 
What if instead of purchasing a grav drive, I could purchase a parcel of land from them? Alternatively, the game could let me find the original charter for the ECS constant to prove that the colonists have a legal precedent to land there. Or I could just kill the CEO. Unfortunately, that is not an option. It's like the game wants you to forget about what you learned about the ECS constant when you first walk through the ship. Despite the game setting me up as a diplomat, I have no way to negotiate or strike a deal that is good for the colonists. I tried going back to the ship and asking them what they think of the resolutions in an attempt to negotiate a better deal, but there was no such option. This mission was my first genuine disappointment. It's really sad that there's just no way to help the crew of the ECS Constant here. When looking around Paradiso as a setting, not just the home of a terrible mission, there doesn't seem to be nearly enough set dressing. This is supposed to be a high-class tropical resort, but the guests don't appear to be doing much. When I go to the Chunks restaurant, people are sitting in front of plates with napkins on them. Nobody is choosing their chunks or eating different kinds of chunks. When I mosey on over to the beach, everyone is sitting down watching the water. Nobody is going out for a swim, nobody is riding jet skis around the lake, Nobody's making sandcastles. Nobody is using a metal detector to find treasure. They aren't even applying sunscreen and laying down in different positions. Everyone also wears the same bathing suit, too. Despite there being beach balls littered around, nobody is playing with them. There is a volleyball court, but it remains empty. These two are apparently meditating, but this doesn't really look like meditation. There is mention of wind sailing, but it has been cancelled due to the high winds. Oddly enough, this isn't really reincorporated by having other characters complain about wind ruining their vacation plans and demanding a refund or something. It's a weird way to hand wave the lack of activities happening around the resort while not doing much to reinforce there being high winds. When I go to the rooftop terrace, there are ping pong tables with nobody playing. Some people are sitting in front of food, making the set dressing a little better than what you find at the Chunks restaurant, but they aren't picking it up and eating it. I do think this could have been a great spot to tell a story about these kinds of resorts. There could have been contrast between the seemingly perfect activities that the guests enjoy and a heavily exploited workforce. Unfortunately, Paradiso feels lifeless. The first contact mission isn't merely a bad section of an otherwise good game. It's just another point when the game's writing, set pieces, and mechanics ultimately fail to synthesize into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. I have seen people attribute this to the Bethesda formula being outdated, but I disagree. Blaming a formula for a game being bad is like blaming a cookbook, not the chef, for a meal being inedible. Good game design is timeless. So if a game is genuinely well designed, those design principles can still be used in order to make good games today. The Bethesda formula is centered around creating a character, exploring an open world, and going on an adventure. It is filled with many overlapping systems that help cater to different roleplay experiences. That's not a bad formula, and I wouldn't want Bethesda to radically break the conventions of their games. I just want to see them use the formula better. Just look at Fallout New Vegas. This game is generally considered to be the best Fallout game because it managed to pull out Fallout 3's strengths and improve upon what its immediate predecessor and eventual successors were lacking. This game isn't good in spite of the formula. It's good because Obsidian did a better job using it than Bethesda did. I may not like Fallout 3, but I can at least respect it because without it, Fallout New Vegas wouldn't exist. Similarly, Fallout 4 isn't a bad game because of the formula. It's bad because the RPG elements have taken a backseat in favor of streamlining the gameplay. There's less focus on branching quest lines, so every resolution feels the same. There is no penalty for siding with one faction or the other, so there's never a need to commit to anything. The entire skill system was dumbed down to just being special stats. The conversations were simplified to the point where skill checks are astonishingly rare, and there are no more than four speech choices at any given time. Fallout 4 quickly compounds into a game where every playthrough feels basically the same, no matter your character's build or your choices.
Bethesda games are at their best when the player is at least curious as to what would happen if they chose a different race, picked a different perk, sided with a different faction, went down a different quest line, or explored a different part of the world. My biggest complaint with Starfield is that it lacks this curiosity, which is crazy because this is the biggest game Bethesda has ever made. Just listen to how Todd Howard, executive producer at Bethesda Game Studios, described the game during one of its showings. Let's take a look at one of our planets, Jemison. You can land in New Atlantis, but you can also land and explore anywhere on the planet. And it's not just this planet, it's all the planets in the system. From barren but resource-heavy ice balls to Goldilocks planets with life. And not just this system, but over a hundred systems. Over 1,000 planets, all open for you to explore. Bethesda wanted this game to be big, but bigger is not better. There is no substance to the world that has been crafted. Players can skip out on most of the content in the game, and they wouldn't miss out on much. I'm honestly growing tired of major releases being more concerned with arbitrary measures of content than whether or not the existing content is meaningful and worth revisiting time and time again. Fallout 4, for example, wanted a bigger, more expansive world than Fallout 3, and even one of the developers boasted that they haven't seen everything after 400 hours. However, it still featured all of those aforementioned issues. Eventually, a game becomes too big for its own good, and the scope of the project is ultimately a detriment more so than anything else. It's just more egregious with Starfield, because I was hoping Bethesda would at least learn from Fallout 4's mistakes. Before the release of Fallout 4, Todd Howard had an interview with GameSpot, where he was asked about how Fallout 4 attempts to do so many different things at once, saying, that is the hardest part. We're lucky in that nowadays we're not a very big studio. We're just over a hundred people. But it's also the same team. This is the group that did Fallout 3. This is the group that did Skyrim. We're able to work with people that know our systems and design processes so well. We can complete each other's sentences. So that's how we get so much content. But absolutely, the hardest part is gluing it all together. We're probably doing too much. If the game sucks, the answer may be we have tried to do too much. Unfortunately, this wasn't taken as a sign to be cautious with the next game's scope. Instead, Starfield aimed to do even more than Fallout 4 did. It expanded upon the dialogue and trade systems found from Fallout 4 to be closer to the quality in Skyrim and Fallout 3's dialogue. It carried over the base building from Fallout 4 and recontextualized it as a colony building mechanic. It improved upon the combat by adding space magic powers. It included new space customization. It offered far more landscapes to explore. In order to create a game of this scale, Starfield was forced to rely heavily on procedurally generated content. It's simply not feasible for a team of any size to create custom landscapes for this many planets. It is much easier to create some sort of algorithm that creates the terrain and populates it with structures and other features. Todd Howard defended the use of procedural generation by saying, We do a lot of procedural generation, but I would, I would keep in mind that we've always done that. Right. And it's a big part of Skyrim in terms of questing and some other things we do. We generate landscape using procedural systems, and so we've always kind of worked on it. And a planet by itself, if you think about it, is sort of in a game concept. Just one planet is infinitely big if you're going to do it in some realistic fashion. So once you're dealing with scale like that and procedural systems, the difference between, say, one planet that has some variation on it and a hundred planets or a thousand planets, it's actually not that big of a leap, if that makes sense, yeah. once you have good systems working for that. This is a valid point when it comes to the varied landscapes and dungeons for Starfield. It's not unheard of for procedural generation to be used to create labyrinths with many different rooms, traps, monsters, and treasures. Similarly, there are plenty of games that use procedural generation to create a number of wildly different terrains to explore. However, when it comes to Radiant Quests, these are often considered some of the most mind-numbingly dull content in the game. This one, for example, is a basic math question. All you do is add and subtract until all the values equal 60. If it was removed from the game, nothing of value would be lost. 
it doesn't help that the handcrafted content arguably isn't that much better. There's a reason why clearing out the ghouls in any Fallout 4 mission isn't nearly as compelling as clearing out the ghouls in the mission Come Fly With Me in Fallout New Vegas. In one game, it's as surface level as it gets. Go to a location. Oh, there's monsters. And then you kill the monsters. Hooray. In the other, go to a location. Oh, there's monsters. Wait, not all of them are monsters. This guy thinks he's a ghoul when he's just bald? And I can help them go to space? Now this is a quest. I would rather have one good quest with an engaging premise than a thousand radiant quests with the same fight the monsters premise. no good. But what makes you think his will be any better? Give me that! <laughs> Why, it tastes so good. I think I'd like to try it a second time. It's really depressing going from Fallout New Vegas to Fallout 4 and seeing all the meaningless filler in comparison. With the scope of Starfield, there was genuine reason to be concerned that the game would also be filled with nothingness. Todd Howard did stress that Starfield actually has the most handcrafted content from any other Bethesda game. That we have done more handcrafting in this game, like content-wise, than any game we've done. We're over 200,000 lines of dialogue, so we still do a lot of handcrafting. And if people just want to do like what they're used to in our games, and follow a main quest and do the quest lines, you're, you're gonna see what you'd kind of expect from us. However, imagine if each individual planet was one thirty-second the size of Skyrim's world in terms of scale. Multiplied by a thousand worlds is a landmass 30 times the size of Skyrim. So that should give an idea of the sheer amount of content each game world would need to feel as rich and dense as Skyrim did. There may be some design elements that feel outdated, such as the number of loading screens and the general clunkiness when interacting with NPCs, but I honestly think the crux of the issue is scope. Ocean-wide puddle deep is a phrase that is commonly attributed to the last few Bethesda games and that ocean has only grown wider without adding any additional depth. Starfield is simply too big for its own good. Rather than having a handful of mechanics, with enticing gameplay loops that are constantly being iterated upon as players explore a handful of wildly different planets, it's a bunch of mechanics and sloppily generated landscapes that are poorly woven together. Starfield may be getting patches down the line, but I wouldn't expect a revival like Cyberpunk 2077 had. That game launched with numerous bugs and performance issues, but there was always a good game in there, somewhere. And as those patches were released, it slowly unearthed the good game that was buried under those bugs and performance issues. Just don't forget. The game is fixed. Starfield, on the other hand, would have to go back to the drawing board on plenty of its missions and gameplay mechanics. This game kind of has the opposite problems as Cyberpunk, so even though it is a more polished game at launch, it doesn't appear quite as salvageable. I would rather Bethesda listen to this game's criticisms as a warning for what not to do with the next Elder Scrolls than spend years reworking this game into something that better meets expectations. So let's go back to the beginning and talk about what's wrong with this game. Starfield begins with a slow walk through a mining operation until being asked to dig out a mysterious artifact. This vision is supposed to be the hook for the game but it doesn't have any imagery worth re-watching or analyzing. The game will re-show this exact vision whenever you interact with an artifact or complete a temple. There are a lot of temples in this game, so if you're gonna go after all of them, you're gonna see this cutscene a few dozen times. I don't think this cinematic is interesting enough to be shown as many times as it is. The main story is about finding the artifacts and solving a mystery of what they are. Don't hold on to the edge of your seat, though, because this mystery is nothing special. 
After the first artifact has been collected, it is time to create a character. My main gripe with the character customization is the lack of appealing clothing options. Too many clothing items are unisex jumpsuits. The main characters do wear other kinds of clothes, and if you do like what's on them, there is technically a way to get what they are wearing, but you aren't going to find a similar outfit when exploring. Every outfit I came across was visually uninteresting. It's so mundane that I never pick up an outfit and feel like putting it on my character. There is one silly monster outfit, and there's also one dress, and some outfits that do have skirts, but there aren't a whole lot of other silly outfits or revealing outfits. Every outfit covers from head to toe, so if you designed your character to be muscular or have tattoos, good luck finding an outfit that will actually show that off. I suppose the reason not much creativity was put in the different outfits is because the player will be in the suit a lot of the time, but I would honestly prefer it if the suit was automatically taken off when walking through a town or a peaceful settlement. That way I can see what my character is actually wearing. Anyway, we wake up to seeing Lynn holding the artifact. Wait, if she's holding it, why isn't she seeing any weird visions and hearing music? Apparently, it only affects whoever touched the artifact first. There isn't really much of a logical consistency to the music and the visions. It's just there to make the main character feel special whenever they collect an artifact. Once you step outside, Barrett arrives, followed by the Crimson Fleet. There is a shootout, and then you talk to Barrett. He gives you the one-of-a-kind Frontier spaceship, his robot companion Vasco, and the Constellation Watch, even though you technically aren't a member of Constellation yet, and tells you that you are the chosen one to help Constellation find the artifacts. It even tells the time. It definitely does not tell the time. This opening is a bit much, and by dumping all this stuff on the player, there's no character-defining moment. Getting the ship and becoming a member of Constellation should be a bigger deal than this, but it feels more like I'm just going through the motions. Okay, Lynn, thanks for everything, bye. I think the opening would have been better if it was about how you got the ship. Did you save money until getting something that was space-worthy? Did you salvage it from other crashed ships? Did you steal it? I think there is already plenty of reason to go to Constellation, because they are a faction who explores the stars, and they're working to solve this artifact's mystery. The player character could have known about Constellation, and somehow acquired a ship to reach them. It would retain that character-defining moment where getting your first ship and finally getting off the planet is a lot more exciting. But as it stands, it's kind of just something that happens. The tutorial doesn't actually end here. It first has to explain space exploration and combat. Starfield's biggest blunder is exploration. Right off the bat, there is no way to fly from the planet to the nearby moon or another planet within the solar system. The ship feels like it is tethered to the nearby world. Venturing further requires opening the star map and selecting another planet, or opening the scanner and selecting a destination. Personally, I found it easier to just open the star map because it more plainly showed each of the planets in the solar system. Apparently, it was decided early on that exploration would be segmented. You know, one for Starfield people have asked is, well, can you fly the ship straight down to the planet? No. We decided early in the project that the on-surface is one reality, and then when you're in space is another reality. And if you try to, like, really spend a lot of time engineering the in-between, like that segue, you're just spending a lot of time that's really just not that important to the player, so let's, let's make sure it's awesome when you're on the surface and awesome when you're in space, and those realities look as good as they can be and play as good as they can be for those realities. I wholeheartedly agree with this reasoning. Sometimes in game development, a feature that sounds simple on paper actually opens a Pandora's box of programming challenges. Due to limitations with the engine, making sure all the data for the surface of the planet streams smoothly so it doesn't interrupt the player experience, and all the various edge cases that might have to be accounted for. If not accounting for this transition allows for more development time to be spent making sure space and planet exploration are as fun as possible, then it was the right decision. The issue is, it's absolutely not awesome in space or on the surface. 
I am rather disappointed that there is no way to fly around the solar system. Exploring space feels too segmented. This is likely done to cut down on the amount of time spent traveling from one planet to the other. However, the game also wants players to build a spaceship, upgrade it, and find crewmates to bring aboard. This is something that is meant to progress with a player character. What is the point of investing so much time and resources into building and upgrading a ship if the game is also going to work towards reducing the amount of time spent in outer space? Part of what makes exploration fun is being able to see a distant landmark and watch it slowly come more into view. But the main mechanism of traversal must expose every planet in the solar system to the player. This lessens the sense of discovery and reduces exploration into a matter of popping into a solar system and running through a checklist to survey planets. I would rather fly around an appropriately scaled version of a solar system than constantly see my ship be plopped in front of every planet and moon shortly after a loading screen or a transition. In fact, once you have discovered a planet, you can skip travel there whenever you want without even entering the spaceship. It's honestly kind of astonishing seeing just how disconnected this game is from space travel. It's kind of sad thinking about how the only time you really have to fly a spaceship somewhere is when traveling to a space station. This is one of the few times where there's actually something to fly towards. There are also some vestigial features, such as with the fuel system. The game keeps track of the ship's fuel. Fuel comes from helium-3, which can be extracted from certain planets and moons. However, there is no real reason to pay attention to the fuel count. The ship is immediately refueled whenever you jump to another system, so it only really affects how many jumps you must make before reaching the intended destination. Once you have a big enough fuel supply, or you have discovered a location you can skip travel to that's outside of the jump range, you can pretend the mechanic doesn't even exist. Fuel was originally going to have a greater presence, but the designers did not like how it essentially stopped the game. I read that space travel is considered dangerous in this game. Can you explain? That's more of, that goes back to a tone thing, right? When you actually play the game, because it's a game, like, we don't really kill you when you <laughs> fly out in space. Um, but it has a tone of, there's some effort involved. And we've dialed it back as we've been making the game, whereas we used to run out of fuel. You jump and get stranded, which on paper was a great, like, it's a great moment when you get stranded and you have to press this beacon and you don't know who's going to come. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that's not like, it just stops your game. We found, you'd be playing the game and I ran out of fuel. Okay, I guess I'll just wander these planets trying to mine for fuel so I can get back to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's a fun killer. I kind of understand the logic to that, but the problem is, without a fuel mechanic, exploration is now even more mindless. If there was fuel in the game, at least there would be some consumable that you have to conserve or find a way to harvest. Stopping the game would just be a punishment for not paying attention to a crucial resource. While traveling through space, there are some random encounters. Oftentimes, there will be a battle against space pirates. Other times, it may be a friendly ship who opens their communications channel to you. Because I did not have to go out of my way to find these encounters, there is no agency to them. I didn't battle these pirates because I wanted to, I did it because the game happened to force me into an encounter with them. Similarly, I didn't speak to this vessel because I found a friendly spacecraft on my adventure and wanted to make contact with it. The game just happened to force me to communicate with it. The game also doesn't have that many of these random encounters, so you may see the same exact one multiple times throughout your adventure. I speculate this is a side effect of how the game handles traversal. It couldn't hide these encounters, so instead it just randomly decides what encounter you are going to get whenever you skip travel. The existing encounters are ultimately cheapened. It would be nice if traversal were designed in a way that there could be more secret encounters so I can find derelict spaceships, space stations that are just outside of reach, and even wacky scenarios like a gas giant with rings that were repurposed to be a racetrack. The design also makes some gameplay mechanics feel unnecessary. 
For example, there's a stealth mechanic where you can power down the ship in order to sneak up to enemies. But since the game will have enemies jump to your position to engage in battle, there is almost never an opportunity to use it. Stealth ships could be useful if the game allowed seamless flights around the solar system, so I could power down my engines or activate some kind of cloaking device in order to carefully maneuver past enemy ships or sneak contraband into a planet. There's a lot of untapped potential with space traversal, but Starfield is a game that almost seems afraid of having the player fly through space. I must give some credit to ship customization, because I actually did have fun designing my ship. However, due to competing systems, it wasn't too rewarding to build one. At first, I found ship combat to be annoying because I was outnumbered and my ship seemed too slow to turn around and face whatever was shooting at me. I figured the problem was the Frontier just doesn't cut it and I needed to build my own ship. That's not quite accurate. The other part of the problem is, to get the most out of your ship, you have to invest in skills. I am baffled at how many skills obviously shouldn't be skills. There are skills necessary to deal additional damage, increase turn rate and maneuverability, target specific parts of the ship, increase the max cargo size, increase the shield capacity, and repair systems faster. I think it is fair to say none of these should be skills. Most of them should be determined by the modules used on the ship. Want more damage? Get a stronger weapon. Want better shields? Buy a better shield generator. It should be that simple. It also doesn't really make sense for ship targeting to be inaccessible without a skill. It would make more sense if some cockpits had a targeting computer while others didn't. Not pertaining to combat, there is also a skill that adds a slight chance that contraband will not be detected. However, this should just be a module. There should be a black market where you can buy a module and attach it to your ship so you can better sneak contraband beyond certain areas. Once you unlock the skill, getting higher tiers within the skill requires completing some challenge. And if you are late enough in the game, they might be challenges you technically already completed, but it is only now counting towards the next skill. Getting new ship modules, for example, requires the piloting and starship design skills. I don't think this should be a requirement. Instead, I would rather have to prove myself a competent pilot through training or doing special missions. The skill system and the shipbuilding are two competing systems. On one side, the player is encouraged to get better ship parts so they can be more effective in combat, hoard more items, and travel deeper into space. Meanwhile, they are being told that it won't make much of a difference, so they really just need to grind for more experience. Aside from that, customizing a ship is a lot of fun. I do like the wacky designs I can create for it, and I actually prefer that the interiors come fully decorated. But I also think it would be nice if there was an option to lay down empty habs, with more fine-tuned options for customization for players who actually want to take the time to do that. It would also be great if the layout of the interiors wasn't terrible. There is no way to decide where the ship will place new doors, so the game may not pick a convenient layout. It would make a lot more sense if I could choose how different rooms connect to each other. I also don't like how there is no way to view all of the possible modules at once. Different vendors sell different ship parts, so if you're trying to find something specific, it could be a bit of a pain going back and forth between each of the vendors in order to find the part that you are actually looking for. I like the idea of unlocking new modules over time, but I do wish there was one consolidated location where I can go all out with different parts from different vendors. Finally, at launch, it was annoying to scrounge enough credits to afford customizing a ship. It seemed like every vendor had one-tenth of the credits they should have, and when ships can cost tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of credits, it is really annoying to only be able to make a few thousand at a time. Once I have built an adequate ship and got the necessary skills, I had a better time in ship combat. I think if the game didn't rely so much on skills and focused entirely on ship modules, combat in space would be a much better experience. Although there's still the matter of the diverting power mechanic. 
The game also requires you to power up and power down different systems on the ship, but I found it to be really tedious because I would rather focus on combat and instead I had to divert my attention to the bottom left corner of the screen just to divert power. I definitely would not miss this mechanic if it was removed from the game. As an alternative to building a ship, you may also steal one. Ships randomly land on planets, and you may be able to board them, clear out the ship, and claim it as your own. But be warned, because of the game's skill system, you might not be able to pilot it, making this a waste of time. Alternatively, you can kill another ship's engines, but I found that other ships were often too fragile for this to be reliable. Plus, it can be surprisingly difficult to actually find enemy spaceships. There's also no easy way to check the quality of an enemy ship. There is no way to know what's on a ship without taking it to a ship manufacturer. So either you can board a ship in the hopes that it will be better than the one you currently have, or you can just focus on upgrading the frontier. I honestly think it's for the best to just focus on upgrading the frontier. Despite Barrett giving you his classic one-of-a-kind spaceship, he doesn't seem to mind you turning it into a monstrosity like this. But honestly, that is all the more reason that the game probably should have focused on giving you your own ship that you upgrade throughout the entire game. I really don't like how this is technically Barrett's ship, but he just happened to give it to me because of main character. Finally, back to the tutorial. After a space battle with pirates, you must go to the moon Crete and learn how to shoot pirates on foot. When it comes to the game's combat, it's nothing special. The main issue is, of course, the skill system. Some skills increase the damage output of certain weapon types. This essentially devalues weapon types if you are not spending skill points on them. For example, in order to effectively use laser weapons, you must level up the laser skill, which also requires you to kill enemies with laser weapons. So if you haven't been putting points into that skill anyway, the laser weapons you come across are going to effectively be worse than other weapons. The same applies for pistols, shotguns, melee weapons, and other weapon types. There's also an armor penetration skill. Why? Why not have armor piercing ammo? It's another one of those skills that shouldn't be skills. Players should be able to naturally come across better weapons and different ammo types as they progress through the game. I think the bigger issue here is that weapon does more damage is a lame skill. It only replaces the need to craft or find better weapons, thus taking away part of the gameplay loop, which involves finding and purchasing better weapons. Preferably, a skill would be an extension of the core mechanics, such as dual-wielding pistols, new acrobatic techniques to dodge better, new finishers and takedowns. I would like to see more creativity in the combat skills than weapon hits harder now. When it comes to stealth, it is very difficult to sneak around early on. For example, this is the tutorial area. And watch as I try to sneak up to a few pirates who are clearly distracted by audio logs of someone being attacked by a terramorph. <laughs> Enemies in this game act like they have eyes in the back of their heads. They remain hyper aware of their surroundings, so it is easy to fail stealth and be forced into a firefight. The companion doesn't even seem to have any awareness of whether or not you are trying to sneak around either. They will attack whoever they can see, so if you want to use stealth, you're better off exploring by yourself. Much like with a lot of the game's mechanics, you must also commit to using stealth early on and make some preparations to get the most out of it. Unlike other Bethesda games, Starfield doesn't even tell you if you are visible to enemies without getting a skill first. There is no way to know how concealed you are until you get the stealth skill. I really don't like the idea of skills that merely hide UI elements from the player. Another necessary skill is concealment which allows you to avoid setting off mines, run without affecting stealth, and makes you invisible while sneaking. All of these are invaluable to anyone who is attempting a stealth build. With these skills and a weapon mod to suppress gunfire, players may have an easier time performing stealth kills. 
I specify gunfire because melee doesn't even seem to be feasible. It takes a lot of luck to get close enough to an enemy for a melee attack, and even if you do hit them, it's not a guaranteed takedown. When I look at the stealth system as a whole, it's like Bethesda saw the stealth archer build in Skyrim and decided to avoid it by nerfing stealth entirely. As of right now, it seems like stealth is only useful for opportunistic kills immediately before starting a battle. The level design doesn't seem to encourage stealth either. On one Radiant quest, I was making my way through a research laboratory, but once I opened this door, everyone on the inside immediately started shooting at me. And there didn't seem to be an alternative way of getting into the room. I couldn't open a window or crawl through a vent or anything. I was able to sneak around to this room with a terminal, but since I wasn't putting skill points into hacking, I couldn't hack the device. I understand this is basically how Fallout handles hacking too, but I kinda wish Starfield did something a little more distinct. Like what if you had a device that automatically performed hacking and lockpicking, but you just had to guard it until it was finished and other enemies may be alerted that something was hacking into their system and opening doors. I think there are a lot of better ways to play into the futuristic setting, without just blindly copying mechanics from Fallout. It kind of bothers me that despite Starfield taking place in the distant future, there aren't a whole lot of futuristic technologies to take advantage of. We have drones in the real world today. Why can't I have a combat drone to scout these bases and search through crawl spaces that are smaller than my character? This game feels tremendously unimaginative, so it doesn't really have any genuine innovation. I honestly can't blame anyone for thinking this game's combat is just Fallout in space. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not expecting a radically different combat system, but I am expecting it to stand out on its own merits. Stealth isn't an option, so you might as well just start shooting whatever enemy you see. The only weapon stat worth paying attention to is damage per second, and a lot of challenge can be trivialized by stocking up on stim packs. I mean med packs. There should have been more enemy types because in the lore, there are mechs and bioweapons that were ultimately banned. It is a nonsensical justification for why mechs aren't seen in action. I mean, if pirates are willing to battle any ships, smuggle contraband, and raid abandoned outposts, why would they not use battle mechs or bioweapons? I think seeing mechs and monster-like aliens would have made combat more fun. Perhaps they could have treated them like boss battles at key parts of the story or other quest lines. Most encounters with enemies feel the same. It's either someone in a suit who shoots at first sight, a turret, or an alien. I am not exaggerating much when I say that once you've seen this combat encounter on Crete, you're not going to see anything that is significantly different. The Starborn powers are intended to make the combat stand out. To gain a Starborn power, you must go to a temple, complete a dumb minigame where you fly through a bunch of floating orb thingies, and then you fly to the center of the rings, and then you gain a power. But once I got a bunch of them, I had trouble remembering which powers were actually new. There are a lot of different Starborn powers that can be used. However, since all the temples are the same, I do wish they were designed to actually show the utility of the power that I'm getting. That way I didn't need to experiment on my own. It would also help cut down on the repetition because every single one of these challenges is the same. The Starborn powers are fine, but they would be a lot more interesting if it was possible to use them in combos. There's only enough magic in order to use one spell at a time. So you can't use a Starborn power, switch over to a different one, and use the other spell without waiting for a cooldown. It's certainly a neat concept, but between it being tedious to actually get a Starborn power and the utility of the actual powers being limited, I never really felt encouraged to use them. A lot of the time, I honestly forgot that I had the powers and didn't start using them until I was capturing footage of me using the powers. Finally, the combat just has no flair. There are no stylish finishers when killing enemies, there are no cool reload or equip animations, there is no limb damage so you're not going to slice someone's arms off, 
It doesn't seem like you can knock an enemy's weapon out of their hands. There's no way to do any quick dodges. It's a lot of ducking in and out of cover. The boost pack can be used to gain a height advantage, but that's about it. It would be cool if the boost pack played into the action by letting you charge into enemies with brute force, or do some really cool slides around the map. Starfield's combat is serviceable, but it could be a lot more fun if there was more pizzazz to how you engage enemies. Anyway, once the pirates and Crete have been dealt with, it's time to go to New Atlantis. Before delving into the main story, I do want to talk about what it is like to explore planets. It's boring. This game relies too much on procedural generation, and it kind of has to. It's not feasible to create handcrafted content for 1,000 worlds, so instead it generates terrain and plops down some prefabricated structures. It also runs out of this content fast. So you are likely going to see the same structures repeating after just visiting a couple of planets. The landscapes feel incredibly limited. The shape of the terrain mainly consists of rolling hills, mountains that are too short to feel like mountains, flatlands, and craters. There is a surprising lack of other features such as rivers, cliffs, canyons, volcanoes, icebergs, or mesas. Caves may also appear, but the layouts are usually uninteresting and repetitive. Far too often I go into a cave, and I swear it has the exact same layout as other caves. Starfield probably could have taken notes from something like Minecraft and used 3D Perlin noise with Perlin worms in order to create caves, overhangs, and generally more interesting geometry. But instead, since it's using a 2D height map to generate the terrain, the features are a lot less interesting. Consequently, each planet feels the same as far as terrain goes, with a different biome painted on top of it. Each planet does have environmental effects, but they largely can be ignored without much consequence. This feature was originally going to play a bigger role, but it was ultimately nerfed. Uh, I'll give you an example on Starfield. So the way the environmental f damage works in the game on planets and on your suit, and you, you know you can uh, you have uh, resistances to certain types of atmosphere effects, whether that's radiation or thermal, etc. And that was a pretty it's a pretty complex system actually. It was very punitive, and so we kept trying where you get these afflictions. We kept trying to tune it. We get a point where we're tuning it, and you're having to heal those things. And what we did at the end of the day, is it, and it was a complicated system for players to understand, is we just made, we just nerfed the hell out of it. Hmm. Where it ends up being, it matters, but only a little bit. It at, matters more in flavor. Like the affliction you get is more annoying knowing you have it than the game result. Usually, I'm generalizing. So it was, let's just dial it down. Because if we dial it way back, it becomes more flavor on the screen than it does a gameplay system we had originally wanted where, okay, I have multiple spacesuits. I have one for high radiation planets. I have one for really cold planets. I have ones for these environments. And I'm saying it now, people are playing the game, like you don't think about it that much. If I am understanding the system correctly, it originally would have functioned similarly to Breath of the Wild, where the player must equip different armor sets to explore hot and cold regions. I kind of wish Bethesda tried to make this system work in Starfield, having some planets be gated off to the player until they find or purchase an appropriate suit could be interesting, as it would provide a feeling that the explorable universe was expanding as the game was being played. Maybe there could have just been a system that automatically equipped the appropriate suit when landing, so it would be a matter of having a different suit for each environmental effect in the ship's inventory. Each biome may be home to different flora and fauna. It kind of bugs me that a lot of the animals in this game looks like giant bugs or reptilians. I don't remember finding any creatures with fur. There's nothing that resembles dogs, mammoths, apes, or any other furry creatures. Similarly, I don't remember seeing an animal with feathers. I know birds aren't real and horses don't exist, but that's no excuse to not have something that resembles these fantastical creatures. I wish there was more creativity in the designs, so I didn't feel like every animal was either a dinosaur or an insect. 
One detail I do like is how the game attempts to emulate an ecosystem by having predators attack their prey. However, they don't stick around to eat the carcass. I also don't remember seeing any herbivores, so what is eating the plants? These details would be nice to further the feeling that there is a living ecosystem waiting to be observed. Planets may also have some kind of feature. Once you discover an anomaly, you scan it and that's it. Is there a valuable resource? No. Does it segue into a quest? No. Does anyone make any mention of it? No. Are there tourists trying to check out these features? No. Does it tie into anything at all? No. It's just decoration. And these decorations may also be repeated on other planets. So you can land on a different world and be expected to scan something that you scanned on another planet. Surveying the planets is largely uninteresting. It quickly devolves into a game of running around from one point of interest to the other, scanning it, and jumping to another part of the planet. I rarely found myself sticking around in one location for an extended period of time because, more often than not, there was no genuine reason to stick around. As of now, the most interesting content, and I say that loosely, are structures. Sometimes there will be an outpost with friendly NPCs who will give you a random task. Other times there will be an outpost with pirates who shoot at first sight. The planets have no story to tell, no characters to meet, everything is sort of just there. Since the game relies on procedural generation to create its landscapes, there is no sense of belonging. It lacks the human touch. When I find a civilian outpost, I ask, why is this here? Where does the food and water come from? When I find an abandoned facility, I ask, why is it abandoned? Was there a violent storm that destabilized the structure? Was it attacked by aliens or pirates? There's also the bigger picture of how do these structures play with each other? Why does this moon or this planet have these structures? How do people get from one place to another? Sadly, the game has no answers to these questions because it was never designed to answer them. This is a limitation of procedural generation. It's great for creating a bunch of different terrains, but it is terrible at world building, since it is really just pulling together some Perlin noise values together to create the landscapes and populate the world with different structures and other features. Each of the structures are also aesthetically the same. The game also loves to repeat them, so chances are, if you thoroughly explored one planet, you will find the exact same features and structures on the other. Eventually, I realized that I just don't care to explore different planets. There is no substance to them, it's just a bunch of slop. Where's the love? When perusing through a list of what can generate on a planet, it sounds like there are a lot of different combinations, but I don't think it is enough to make a thousand worlds meaningful. Players can probably skip exploring most of the planets in the game and they wouldn't miss out on much. It genuinely pains me seeing how many locations don't have much more to offer than loot or random tasks. When I first started Starfield, I thought I was liking it more than Fallout 4, but handcrafted content is so important for an RPG that I've changed my mind. Fallout 4 is a better game to me now, because at least the world had some substance to it. It's not enough to just throw the player into a vast expanse that can be explored. They must want to visit whatever landmarks they come across, either in the search of new weapons, new armor, a fun questline, or something that looks cool. Unfortunately, Starfield is wide as an ocean and deep as a puddle. Once you have thoroughly explored one world, you have explored them all. The only thing left to find is the same structures again, the same life forms again, the same biomes again, and the same enemies again. I have heard complaints that the explorable space is limited, and to explore the other parts of the planet, you must fast travel elsewhere, but I am not sure why anyone would want to explore the entire planet. It would just be more barren nothingness in the hopes that you eventually come across something of substance. It's also not possible to explore the whole planet, despite the game appearing as though you are selecting a location to land. If I were to take my cursor and bring it as close to an existing location as possible, I will still spawn in a completely different landscape. 
The landing site is more like a seed to generate the terrain and its features, which is honestly all the more reason that there should have been fewer worlds, and only a portion of each planet can be explored. The explorable space is just way too big. It's important to find a sweet spot with the density of each point of interest. The developers of The Witcher 3 have coined the 40-second rule to describe the ideal density of content, so players remain engaged with exploration. And so we would try to put these places close to each other, connected by main roads, etc. After that, we just took literally blue cylinders <laughs> um, and we placed them on the map in 3D where we thought these places would be. Right. And then we started just running in between them and taking the time, basically going, all right, so now it seems that every minute I run into one of these locations, which could be of any size. Like we d didn't really define if this is a major location or just your average of it, um, campfire. We did some tests and we found out that uh, player is focused on stuff which we produce, like uh, every 30 seconds players should see something and focus on it, like a pack of deers, some opponents, uh, some NPCs wandering about. Mm -hmm. So we have our rule of 30 seconds. In Starfield, travel time between engaging content is much longer than 40 seconds. It could be minutes as you walk in a straight line to a point of interest. Since other points of interest may be far away from the one you are heading to, you may not feel inclined to even visit them. Also, with the points of interest being randomly generated and repeated, the amount of time it takes to find something new will only keep increasing. It takes way too long to find meaningful content when exploring, which makes it feel like a complete drag. One solution to this problem would be to give the player rovers, and it is surprising that the game still doesn't have them. The other solution would be to make the explorable parts of each planet smaller. I would rather visit a portion of the planet that is actually rich with content than jump from deserted wasteland to deserted wasteland in the hopes that this time I will actually find something meaningful, something memorable, something that actually made the trip feel worth it. In an interview with New York Times, Bethesda's managing director, Ashley Shang, defended this design choice by saying not every location is supposed to be Disney World. The point of the vastness of space is you should feel small. It should feel overwhelming. Everyone's concerned that empty planets are going to be boring, but when the astronauts went to the moon, there was nothing there. They certainly weren't bored. Honestly, these remarks are partly why I wanted to make this review. It's strange seeing Bethesda's management be apprehensive about the idea that people find their game boring. You want to know why the astronauts weren't bored on the moon? Because it was the actual moon. This argument would hold some water if the game was a space simulator, but as already discussed, this game scaled back on simulation elements. It doesn't feel overwhelming when fuel and status effects don't matter. Starfield would be better if it had some wacky or intriguing planets. There are no aliens in this game. The only intelligent life forms are humans. It feels rather unimaginative to not have some sort of primitive life forms on other worlds. The only otherworldly technology are the temples, and there's no information regarding who created them. Every advanced technology is man-made. You're not going to find creatures like Exogorths from Star Wars or Thresher Maws from Mass Effect. Every alien life form seems to be the same scale as what you would normally find on Earth. You're not going to find planets where flora and fauna have evolved with bioluminescence so they glow in the dark. The trees look like they were literally just planted from Earth. I think Bethesda made a tremendous error when trying to make space realistically empty. A lot of surveys in Starfield fail to result in anything memorable. Every planet feels so uninspired and mundane that I honestly have a hard time believing that this game has the most handcrafted content out of any Bethesda game. I don't see what this game gains from having a thousand planets. I'm not expecting every planet to feel like Disney World but every planet should be meaningful in its own right. I want to believe there is a better reason for this content than mindless filler to wander towards, but there isn't. 
Part of the reason a lot of the planets and moons feel devoid of content may be because players are intended to construct outposts. I tried to get into the outpost building mechanic, but over time I found this to feel like busy work that failed to properly reward me for the effort I put into it. An outpost is built by finding a planet with resources that are worth extracting, and then placing down an outpost hub. It is important to start with building a power source, a hab, some extractors, a workbench, and a research bench. It's already starting to be fairly resource intensive. Before even building an outpost, players are going to spend a lot of time searching for planets that have the resources that they need to construct this stuff, mining them, and then going back to build some extractors and storage devices. There is a way to mark which resources are needed, but the game doesn't say which planets have them until you're looking right at it, so it's not really helpful. It's possible that a later patch has addressed this, but at launch, and for the time that I played the game in preparation for the review, there is no way to search through planets that you have already surveyed to see if it has a material that you have marked. While mining and collecting other materials, those materials are deposited into the player's inventory, not the ship's inventory. So it's also really easy to get over-encumbered while collecting materials to build an outpost. The outpost mechanic also has the same issue as shipbuilding. Too much of it is tied to skills. In order to get the most out of outposts, players must invest in outpost engineering, zoology, and botany. Then, at a research table, players must expend items to unlock new structures. Early on, there won't be a whole lot of stuff that can be built at an outpost. The only thing I could do at the beginning of the game was build some mining outposts to passively collect resources. I wanted to grow plants to make it easier to collect sealant and create more elaborate structures, so I completed the research to build a greenhouse. I finally placed one down, linked it up to some sweet, sweet dihydrogen monoxide, and then I found that I couldn't create the sealant plant. I was confused because I did discover a plant that had sealant, but the game was telling me that it needed scanning. Apparently, a greenhouse only grows the plants within the same biome, so I would have to find another planet with the same biome, scan a plant that harvests sealant, go back to this outpost, and set it to grow plants with sealant. The whole point of a greenhouse is to regulate the temperature and humidity so you can grow plants from other regions. I should be able to set the greenhouse to whatever biome I want so I can grow these cactus thingies and get my sealant. It's a really strange omission, and there are plenty of times where the outpost building just doesn't feel intuitive. For example, the game has hydroponics halves, but it's actually functionally useless. The only way to grow something is with a greenhouse. So there's no real point in calling it a hydroponics hab, because it's not really hydroponics. I was kind of annoyed after this revelation, so I decided to construct a bed and have my character take a nap. Then, every ecliptic merc in the system thought an outpost growing plants was such a high-profile target that they just had to take the whole thing down. It was at this moment that I remembered something. Fallout 4's base building had walls. It had structural foundations so you can keep the building area level. It had more options for how to build interior spaces since they weren't segmented by halves. There weren't skill checks required to grow tatoes. There weren't buildings with misleading names. I went back to Fallout 4 just to confirm my suspicion, and I honestly think Fallout 4 had this superior base building mechanic. When cleaning up an area, it provides plenty of materials to construct the base. Players don't have to skip travel around the entire map just to get started. It's also clearer how buildings interact with each other. Meanwhile, with Starfield, I had to look up a guide just to figure out how half this stuff worked. People made memes about Preston Garvey and the settlements that need your help, but I'll give the game credit where it's due. It gave a substantial reason to care about building settlements. 
I honestly liked the idea of reclaiming a wasteland and helping people survive in the harsh conditions. Building the Sanctuary Settlement also functions as an adequate tutorial because it provides everything necessary for base building in that one location. Starfield doesn't give as much of a reason to care about these outposts. Despite there being a massive resource investment to actually build an outpost, there doesn't actually seem to be much of a benefit to building one. To make matters worse, it seems like an outright regression from Fallout 4. As it stands, Starfield goes out of its way to making base building as tedious and cumbersome as possible. It needs to be easier to break into this mechanic, otherwise to a lot of players, it won't be worth the time, skill, and resource investment. Okay, so, outpost building is a wash, it's not fun to explore planets or space, combat is just okay, ship building is fine, but it would be better if it wasn't tied to so many skills. So far, I am not impressed with the content that has been explored. Luckily, this game supposedly has the most handmade content out of any Bethesda game. At this point, the handcrafted content needs to be good. Really good. In order to make up for the lackluster content everywhere else. Funny enough, the main content feels like attractions at a theme park. It's kind of ironic that Bethesda defends the boring planets by saying it's not supposed to be Disney World, while the populated planets really are just Disney World. They are a bunch of set pieces with designs that are at least unique on their own right, but much like how the teacups doesn't interact with the ferris wheel, each of the set pieces exist in an isolated bubble. The towns are visually distinct, but they kind of have the same issue as Paradiso, a lack of set dressing. Aquila City, for example, is a cowboy town. There is a bar named The Hitching Post, but since the game doesn't have vehicles, the Freestar Rangers aren't found riding horse-like animals or robot horses. Similarly, because mechs have been banned apparently, you're not going to find giant combat mechs that are being used by Sysdef or the United Colonies. It certainly would have been nice if these kinds of contraptions were around in order to add more details to make each of the locations distinct. I also noticed a lack of wayfinding. When Starfield launched, there weren't any local maps in the game. I don't think this is inherently an issue. Players should be able to navigate based on the design of the world itself. But the game failed to telegraph where key locations are. I know there is a clinic somewhere around New Atlantis, but there is no signage to point me in the right direction. Whenever I tried to find it, I would always give up and just go to the clinic in the well because it was easier to get to. Another minor grievance are the seams when traveling around the towns. When going through an elevator or opening certain doors, the game fades to black and plops the player into another room. I do wish it was more seamless. The elevator ride down to the well would be a lot more interesting if you could actually see this dense underbelly to contrast the pristine upper levels of New Atlantis. In fact, some of the points of interest actually do have elevators, so there doesn't seem to be a technical limitation to not have a natural elevator ride down into the well. The seams only make the exploration feel a lot more cheap. If for some reason it is not feasible to remove all of the seams, it would be better to just keep the music playing in the background. Moving on to Neon, this location is designed like an indoor mall. It's just a hallway with a bunch of corporation buildings, a club, a bar, and so on. This is supposed to be a cyberpunk city without any of the cyber, or punk. The name might as well refer to the neon signs in the background. Starfield gets some criticism for being too sanitized, and Neon is a great example of what's wrong with the game. This is supposed to be a hub of lowlifes and scoundrels, but Neon has all the aesthetics of cyberpunk with none of the evils. It has nothing it wants to say about capitalism, hyperconsumerism, or the forces that would push someone to joining a gang or doing drugs. There is a hallucinogenic drug called Aurora in this city, but when you take the time to look around, you aren't going to find people overdosing on it or buying it from shady people. For a drug that is treated as contraband everywhere except for Neon, the game strays away from showing how bad it is. There are a couple of other settlements, but I am surprised that there aren't a whole lot of towns to populate the settled systems. I also don't like how these set pieces are constrained to just the one part of the planet that you find these towns. 
I also don't like that the handcrafted content is spread incredibly far apart. If the game was consolidated to the Soul System, Alpha Centauri, and a couple of nearby systems, the handcrafted content would feel more dense because these handmade places would actually be close to each other. But as it stands, I have to travel clear across the settled systems just to get to some of these other places. Personally, what makes a location interesting is having wacky and engaging side quests. Unfortunately, a lot of them were uninteresting. In New Homestead, there is a repeatable quest that tasked me with getting special sauce for the chunks. Did that mean going to a chunks factory to discover some uncomfortable secret on how the sauce was made? No, I just got the sauce and came back. A lot of side quests are like this. They are fetch quests that have nothing to say about the characters or the world they inhabit. It's just busy work. The most egregious busy work is when a quest is nothing more than going back and forth talking to NPCs, during which I find myself wondering, why doesn't this game have phones? The recurring issue with Starfield's main regions is they are unremarkable in terms of missions, history, and characters. The more quests I did, the more I realized how plain these locations are. After thoroughly playing the game, I think I have pinpointed the problem. When Bethesda crafts a world, they are more interested in brand recognition than experimenting with new ideas, so they don't have much practice coming up with novel concepts. The cover of Fallout 3 is a Brotherhood of Steel soldier. The same applies for Fallout 4 and 76. This may seem like a minor detail, but Bethesda has essentially branded the Brotherhood of Steel as the face of the Fallout series. Rather than them just being another faction who comes and goes, they have become a mascot. Fallout could have explored entirely new factions to populate the East Coast, but instead they have shoehorned the Brotherhood of Steel into every game, along with Vaults, the Pip-Boy, and Nuka-Cola. The nicest way to interpret this is Bethesda is uncreative and coasts off of nostalgia. Starfield was the first time in a long time to create a genuinely new experience not bound to any pre-existing lore or setting. There was a whole universe of opportunities to create new, interesting experiences. Bethesda could have done just about anything so long as it fit within the science fiction world. Unfortunately, much like how Bethesda's Fallout games borrow elements from the first two games and uncreatively copies them, Starfield also seems to borrow a lot of concepts from other games without injecting much nuance. The sanitized writing goes beyond there not being enough gore or swearing. These set pieces could have been used to craft storylines that challenge something. It could have been a commentary about rugged individualism, unfettered capitalism, the military-industrial complex, unethical labor practices, or something. Instead, I find Starfield to be a game that largely has nothing it wants to say. I don't expect every mission to be thought-provoking. Sometimes cheering someone up by hanging posters of Space Frog from outer space is all a quest needs to be. At the same time, these main regions needed to do something to stand out. The faction quest lines especially should not be afraid of exploring the politics of the region and ending with a resolution where you change some status quo about them. Starfield, unfortunately, is a game that throws out concepts without doing much to explore beyond the surface level. Starfield's identity is described as NASA Punk. It is a bit of a pretentious sounding name, especially since punk is more than an art style. The idea of punk in this context is to take aspects of a culture and push it to an extreme. Nothing about Starfield is punk. There are no narratives that leave room for social commentary or introspection. No status quo is being challenged. There is no rebellious nature within the game whatsoever. The UC Vanguard questline helps exemplify what's wrong with this game in terms of character writing, world building, and storytelling. The premise of this quest is there are these creatures named Terror Morphs who morph and instill terror. Eventually, you discover that Heat Leeches are the creatures who morph into Terror Morphs. How did they know to call them Terror Morphs if they didn't know they morphed? This isn't a Millennium Falcon situation either. Morph describes an action that the creature undertakes. It's a bit of a silly name to give when the surprise is supposed to be that they morph from something else. 
Anyway, you investigate the terror morphs and discover that they are a bioweapon, which is an interesting premise, I'll give it that. If a heat leech is exposed to a type of pollen, they morph into a terror morph. Their natural predator are these big, slow-moving, giant armored drafts called Asales. Somehow, they were capable of hunting the fast-moving spider-like monsters. However, due to a food shortage, humans decided to harvest the Asales to near extinction. The first problem I have with this questline is the logistics of the Terramorphs. For this premise to work, I have to believe that nobody researched heat leeches and terramorphs enough to connect the dots, and nobody understood the role of Asales in their respective ecosystem before harvesting them. It's not a bad premise for a questline, but this feels like a rough draft to a much better story. The person helping along the way is Hadrian, and she is a clone of a war criminal. As you can see, Hadrian and the person she was cloned from are two different genders. People may have seen that one Starfield rant about pronouns and transgender characters, but the funny thing is Hadrian isn't even transgender. She's just a clone who happens to be a different gender than the person she was cloned from. I'm honestly not sure why the story even bothers to point this out. I may have missed something, but I don't believe there is another moment where a character is said to be a clone of someone else. This one line tells us that cloning exists in Starfield's universe, and it never follows through in any meaningful way. Hadrian being a clone adds nothing. There is no internal conflict about gender identity. It isn't used to discuss the ethics of cloning. There is no interpersonal conflict where people take issue with them being a clone. It's just a throwaway line. Starfield is already an incredibly wordy game, so I would appreciate it if scenes actually meant something, and it wasn't just dumping lore for the sake of it. This is what I mean when I say Starfield has nothing it wants to say. Whenever it does have the opportunity to tell an engaging narrative, it doesn't commit. It doesn't consider any bigger implications of whatever details are presented. So you have this awkward scene where Hadrian is said to be a clone, but nobody else in the settled system seems to be a clone. You never come across some kind of cloning facility, and cloning as a concept is never brought up again. The ending of the questline is rather preachy. There are two options to handling the heat leech dilemma. Use a microbe that comes with all sorts of risks, or use a natural predator. For some reason, characters are against the Asales option. The arguments for the microbe are just trust the science, dude. The technology behind the microbe is solved science, Madam President. It isn't dangerous. Using it to wipe out the Terramorphs would be the quickest path to protecting humanity. Okay, what if the microbe mutates? What if it jumps to another organism? What if the Terramorphs become immune? Also, I am trusting the science. My character is a xenobiologist, and this dialogue prompt agrees that the solution is a Sales with freaking laser beams attached to their heads. You know, I have one simple request, and that is to have sharks with freaking laser beams attached to their heads. One thing I do like is when you go down this route, you actually will find a Sales being used to find terramorphs. It's just too bad this game couldn't have had a smaller scope, so these encounters could happen more often. It would be a lot more interesting if the ending of the questline opened up a new questline that followed through with the consequences of the decision. When it comes to the design of the set pieces, I did like the area around the one-of-a-kind salvage. It is probably the most visually interesting location I have visited in the entire playthrough. I'm not sure if that's an insult to how mundane all the other locations are, or a compliment to this one. The UC Vanguard is supposedly one of Starfield's best quest lines, but that honestly makes me less inclined to play any of the others. I think I can guess what the other quest lines entail. It's just going to be a bunch of running back and forth to talk with NPCs and shootouts with the same enemies again, with a bunch of questionable writing decisions to frame why I am doing all this. I honestly just can't bring myself to do any of the other quest lines. I don't even think the main quest line is any better than the side content. Here's the biggest issue I have with the game's main quest. 
It wants the player to believe their character is the most important character in the game at the expense of other characters and factions. What does Constellation do? Well, they give the player something to do, find the artifacts, or tell them where the temples are. Why does the player want to find the artifacts? Because they saw a weird vision, and there's a space mystery that never really gets expounded upon. Why do they want to find the temples? So they can gain space magic powers. The game's central mystery never gets any more in-depth than that. The player is sent to odd places to gather artifacts and return them to Constellation. It's ridiculously repetitive. Go to a mine or a laboratory, shoot some space pirates, mine the artifact, rinse and repeat. It does get a little different when you head to Neon. At this point, you must meet someone in the Astral Lounge to strike a deal and buy the artifact. Conversation in Starfield is rather boring to look at. It's a lot of shot-reverse-shot shot to focus on characters. Sometimes the camera will deviate from staring at everyone's uncanny faces, but a lot of times it is locked into this scene of showing the face. I do wish the game played around with a camera more. During this scene, I close the door behind me, but the camera doesn't turn around to show the door slamming shut. There's nothing visually interesting about talking with NPCs. The cinematography in Starfield leaves a lot more to be desired. The voice direction is lacking, so these scenes wind up losing a lot of tension. Everyone begins speaking with a formal, casual tone. Expression isn't portrayed in unique body language either, so I often found myself zoning out and not really paying attention to conversation because it was always boring to sit through. I honestly think Fallout 4 might have had better conversations, simply because it actually played with the camera more, and entering a conversation felt more natural. After striking a deal, there is a scene where your ship is locked down, which leads to a wild goose chase. I guess the game just didn't have enough combat encounters or something, so here's one that didn't feel particularly necessary. What happens next is actually kind of interesting. You hold something you have no right to. My people have killed for this, but I will hold oh. yeah. I was actually kind of excited when I first saw this, because I thought this meant the game was going to be about humanity's first contact with some alien race. Science fiction stories usually take place after intelligent life forms have been discovered, so this would be a nice change of pace. However, the answer to what are Starborn is more dumb than that. These are beings from another universe who collected artifacts from one universe and are now doing it all again for some reason. Anyway, the next mission is to travel to the Sko. The layout of the ship is interesting, but is barely used in the actual questline. It's really strange that I am forced to steal the artifact from this collector. An RPG is supposed to be about player choice, but instead, it forced me to get a 500 credit bounty. I have a weird theory for why the mission is designed like this. It's to ensure players don't miss out on the Crimson Fleet questline. By forcing the player to steal the artifact and getting a bounty, the next time they fly to Jemison, they will be interrogated by Sysdef over a 500 credit fine. Of course, most players would rather just accept a quest than the alternative. The next main story mission involves a dumb sequence where everyone in Constellation goes to the Eye to make repairs. Then there's an attack at both the Lodge and the Eye. I stayed by to protect the Lodge, which led to Sarah Morgan's death. I suppose now is a good time to talk about the main companions. They each have a special mission dealing with some conflict in their life. As you talk to your companion, they will expose information about their past and eventually give you the mission. Sarah Morgan, for example, wanted to revisit her crash site on Cassiopeia because the guilt was eating away at her. She discovers that there were actually other survivors of the crash who had a child together. I honestly don't know how this didn't make her feel worse. I understand Sarah tried to send a search party and was denied that request, 
but after she became a part of Constellation, she could have gone to this planet whenever to check up on the crash site. Did nobody else know about or even care about Sarah's dilemma? For such a tight-knit group of researchers, it sure does seem like nobody wants to open up to each other. I decided to take Sona back to the Lodge, because obviously she's better off at the Lodge than fending for herself on some other planet. It's honestly kind of comical that this game introduces them just to do nothing with them. Sona kind of meanders around the Lodge from this point forward. She doesn't even make friends with Korra, the only other child character with a suspiciously similar model who is almost the same age and has almost the same name. Oh, and it's also the same model as this one from Akilla City. Most handcrafted content in any Bethesda game. Yeah, sure, I totally believe that. When writing a twist, it is important to be careful of what kind of twist is being introduced. Sure, this ending is unexpected, but it only managed to make the situation worse. The game tries to paint Sarah being Sora's adoptive mother as a happy ending, but there is no making this right, only better than it was. It is also rather nonsensical. It would make more sense to find any existing family members who can take Sora in or some kind of foster care than Sarah suddenly decides to become an adopted mother who never mentions Sora again. I'll confess, I didn't really feel like doing any of the other companion quests. I certainly tried to interact with the other characters, but I only did Sarah's questline because she happened to be my companion most of the time. I didn't feel like grinding enough character like that points in order to access the other quest lines. It would be a lot better if characters just explained their problem over the course of one conversation instead of breaking it up by several of them. I would probably have liked the cast more if they had a substantial role in the story. My character feels less like a part of Constellation and more like the only person who really does anything while the rest of them tags along. This compounds into an unremarkable cast of characters who don't feel particularly necessary to the story. Back to the person who dies, there is a funeral for them, but it is handled terribly. For one thing, there is no music to set the tone of the scene. It's just playing the regular Lodge music. I guess I have to do it myself. I thought maybe I would come up with something to say, but I've... Got nothing. So, instead, I thought I would quote something that gave me comfort a long time ago. More importantly, the characters don't even talk about the person who died when they are presenting these speeches. Rather than telling stories about the character to make them feel more interconnected, everyone spews some philosophical mumbo-jumbo. You all might not like thinking about this, but when we die, Everything about us breaks down, decomposes, gets eaten up by insects and microbes. Or due to the lack of a biosphere, we are simply carried away by space and time until we sizzle in the distant sun's corona, get pulled in some gravitational field, coalesce with other debris. It makes the funeral feel generic. This doesn't feel like something you would say at Sarah's funeral. It feels like something that can be said at anyone's funeral. And that genuinely bothers me when Constellation is supposed to be this tight-knit team of space explorers. Losing a part of the main cast could be impactful when it is handled well. Sadly, when a character is killed off in Starfield, it doesn't change the story. Everything continues the same way as before, with the only difference being maybe you lost your favorite companion. This is why I don't have much confidence that the general consensus of the game will improve without a total rewrite. Sarah Morgan's death is so poorly handled that it is completely pointless. It doesn't add to the narrative, it's just there as shock value. It exists to surprise people that the story killed off a companion, but they were already so insubstantial to the main story that nothing feels missing without them. With that out of the way, the next mission is to track down the Starborn, which leads to finding the Hunter and the Emissary. Here's the shocking reveal. Starborn are humans from another universe who collected all the artifacts and traveled through Unity to do it again. The artifacts are used to create this device that travels to another universe. So you can create a device 
to travel to another universe so you can create a device. This is just recursion, the video game. Starfield is a story that wants to tackle the multiverse. Starfield is a story that wants to tackle the multiverse. And this is not a decision I can really agree with. I'd rather the story have been self-contained to its own universe, especially since jumping to other multiverses doesn't mean much more than playing the same game again in what is basically New Game Plus. Afterwards, I went to Earth and found NASA. The puzzles in this mission are incredibly lame. It's always, this door needs power, the switch or power source is adjacent to it. It's a long mission without any enemies and there's a lore dump. The big reveal here is the first grav drives had an error that destroyed Earth's magnetosphere, so humanity ended up sacrificing their homeworld for space travel. Once you grab the artifact here, there is a shootout with Starborn. At this moment, I began to realize just how convoluted the whole Starborn storyline actually is. Supposedly, all of the Starborn I am fighting at this moment are a part of the same competition to collect each of the artifacts. How did so many of them pass through Unity if it was so difficult? Why did so many of them care to do it a second time? If I know these are humans, why can I only seem to talk to two of them? There is no other Starborn who is interested in seeing someone new collect the artifacts. There's no other Starborn who wants to help you. There's no infighting between Starborn. The game wants me to act like they are another faction while also treating them as a bunch of mindless raiders. Doesn't this game have enough combat encounters with guys in suits who shoot at first sight? The next mission is certainly a highlight of the game. The premise of this mission is that this research laboratory is split between two realities. In one, an experiment went horribly wrong and killed the research group, minus one sole survivor. In another, a fire was contained, but it led to the death of the person who survived in the other universe. Finally, a mission that seems to understand how to tell a story of multiverses. Show the different consequences of someone's actions, and have the player explore those consequences. It only took the second to last mission in the game. While the concept for the mission is great, the gameplay is incredibly tedious. At first it is fine, but it gets to a point where I'm just hopping between realities in a large maze. The game has no local maps, so it is easy to get lost and run around in circles. Even if it did, the game would need a local map for both realities that were visible at the same time, so I can clearly see how to navigate through the maze. The maze by itself isn't too bad, just annoying, but the whole area is crawling with enemies. I honestly think there are more enemies here than in any other point of the game. I got so tired of fighting them that I set the game to the lowest difficulty just so I can have a better time. Apparently, there is an ending that lets you save the Soul Survivor and the Research Lab, but it's such an exhausting mission that I didn't care to do it. I only saved the Research Lab. Even once you have grabbed the artifact and selected a reality, it's still not over. You must backtrack through the entire level just to get back to the lab. It's a great premise, but it is bogged down by having way too many enemies and not much clarity with where to go next. After stocking up on supplies again, I made my way to the next mission. What's it gonna be? Is it another shootout with spacers and then a shootout with Starborn and then you grab the artifact? No, it's different. It's a shootout with Starborn, then a shootout with Ecliptic, then a shootout with Starborn, because why would you want the final mission to be different from the other missions in the game? The final boss is supposed to be the Hunter, but you can quite easily talk him down with a persuasion skill check. I would enjoy knowing something I did confuse their uptight view of the multiverse. I suddenly find myself feeling the weight of years. At this point, I finally collected all the MacGuffins and I could claim my prize. Sir, you've earned this. I give you... The MacGuffin. With all the artifacts in hand, I needed to place them on the armillary. Somehow, even though I built it on an outpost, it changes how my ship goes through space to reach Unity. Ooh. 
Was it really too much to just turn off the UI elements when entering the ending of the game? At this point, I met the queen of all cosmos. I named my character this because I thought it would be funny. Aside from that humorous detail, I think this ending is terrible. The character I'm speaking to is basically the star child in Mass Effect 3. They're not a character, more of a vessel to move things along while providing poor explanations to anything that is actually happening. An ending needs to give the player closure. It needs to answer any burning questions while also wrapping up conflicts and character arcs. Starfield's main story is centered around the mystery of the artifacts, the temples, and the Starborn. But when taking the time to ask about any of this, this is the response. Unknowingly, you just answered your own questions. For who creates things but creators? That is what they have been named throughout the endless circle of time. Are they one or many? Human or alien? Terrestrial or celestial? One day, you might even meet the creators. But not this day. As for the why, so that you could ask that very question. So that you could stand before me for time immemorial and delve into the mysteries of the unending cosmos. Wow, the creators created it. I can't believe it. Okay, I take back the Star Child comparison. At least he tries to explain the role of the Reapers, even though the game probably didn't need to do that. Simply adding some lore to the creators would actually make the mystery feel more compelling. Imagine if this game was about uncovering the secrets of the first civilization who achieved spaceflight, and these artifacts were clues that helped you understand what happened to them. As it stands, the artifacts are worthless. They could have been replaced with anything, and it wouldn't make a difference. This whole game was spent pursuing the mystery of the artifacts, and it ends without really learning much about them, other than it being a portal to another universe. I would much rather an ending feel like a conclusion to a story than a justification for New Game Plus. There isn't even much of a reason to become a Starborn either. It's just another run through the same game with the same perks. So if you want to experiment with different perks, you have to completely start from scratch anyway. A new universe awaits you. Who will you be in this one? What choices will you make? You know, ending on this line would be a lot more impactful if the choices I made seemed to matter. But as I discussed in the beginning of the video, there are plenty of times where there are choices I want to be able to make, but is just simply not an option. At no point in the game did I dwell on the consequences of my actions because it was never really designed to have consequences. So here I am, at the ending of the game, and all I can say is this experience has been incredibly hollow. Starfield embodies everything wrong with Bethesda. The painful lack of innovation, the over-reliance on mod support, the lack of coherent vision, the clashing gameplay mechanics, the vestigial gameplay features, the oversimplification of RPG elements, the sanitized writing, the lack of meaningful world-building lore and characters, the awful, awful storytelling. I genuinely don't think there is a single concept this game executed well. The entire game is more concerned with vomiting content than having a handcrafted world worth getting lost in. Starfield is probably Bethesda's most polished game, but it's easily their worst designed game. It's astonishing that it manages to regress from Fallout 4 and Skyrim as though they have learned no lessons from game to game. I think it is fair to say Bethesda simply couldn't make Starfield, not with their current leadership and design methodology. Starfield is probably the least interesting, least creative science fiction setting I have ever seen. Bethesda really did create a science fiction space adventure where the only intelligent life forms are humans. I miss when I thought Starborn were aliens. It's kind of sad thinking about how Bethesda could have done just about anything when making a new open world adventure, and this is what they delivered. They aren't going to have a chance of making a new series for a long time. It's all sequels to Fallout, Elder Scrolls, and Starfield from now on. In fact, this kills my interest in future Bethesda games. It has been a tremendously long wait for the next Elder Scrolls, but I am done waiting. Based on their track record with Fallout 4 and now Starfield, I know it's not even going to be worth the attention. <laughs>